Turning now to domestic news and the new debate around benefits for seniors. The Bloc, as part of its ultimatum to the Liberals, wants to see Bill C-319 become law before the end of the month. That bill would prompt a 10% increase to old age security payouts for seniors between the ages of 65 and 74. The plan has the support of most MPs except Liberals who have largely voted against it. And it's not just parliamentarians who are in favor of a boost to OA OAS. Pardon me. According to new exclusive numbers for CTV from Nanos Research, more than three quarters of respondents either support or somewhat support increasing OAS. With me now to talk about this more is Government House Leader Karina Gold. Minister, good to see you. Thank you very much for making the time. Thank you for having me, Vashi. You outlined in our previous discussions this week that you and uh, the Liberals who voted against this bill were primarily voting against it because, or this motion, pardon me, because it would have set a bad precedent of essentially, you know, using that process to give a private member's bill or a policy royal recommendation. Um, you didn't, you, you at the time mentioned that you were still open to, uh, at least from what I gathered, a discussion around pursuing the policy specific as the, specific to how the bloc had laid it out. Is that still the case? Are you, do you, have you taken a formal position on the policy itself? Uh, no, we haven't taken a formal position on the policy itself, and we are, you know, open to having conversations uh, with the Bloc, uh, as we have been having conversations with all political parties in the House of Commons as to how we can make Parliament work. But also, you know, I think our government has demonstrated over the years that when we hear good ideas about how we can support Canadians, that we're willing to take those on and move them forward. And so what can I gather from how you will make the determination here? Is this a negotiation that is taking place? Is it a policy decision that you will make within this sitting? Uh, is that ultimatum deadline that the Bloc has issued one that you're going to work with? Like, what can you tell Canadians who are watching today about how you're going to make this choice? Well, I think all of those things that you put on the table are factors in the consideration. Um, and, you know, ultimately, our job is to make sure that we are delivering effective policy and programs for Canadians. That's the role of the government and in a minority parliament. That means, you know, working with other opposition parties to see how we advance those measures. So I think everything that you mentioned is something that comes into consideration as we are considering this policy and, and any other policy that comes forward during this minority government. In this case, though, the bloc has been a bit more specific. They're not just saying, let's let's work together for a good outcome for Canadians. They're saying, you have to do this, and the explicit this is pass our bill by October 29th. If, if that discussion, if that part of the discussion is on the table, doesn't that, too, set a kind of troubling precedent? I mean, if the government is going to make policy based on ultimatum set by an opposition party, is that really working for Canadians? Well, as I said, Fashi, um, my job is to work for Canadians. And so that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Um, we're open to good ideas, um, but ultimately we're going to move forward with things that are good ideas for Canadians. And, you know, it's up to the government to set budgetary priorities. Um, and so that's what we're going to continue to do. Uh, but as I've mentioned many times with you and in several other uh, media spaces, my job is to speak to all of the parties, uh, to hear all of their ideas and figure out how we can make Parliament work uh, in the best way for Canadians. So you're okay with an opposition party setting an ultimatum like the one the Bloc has? Like that is, that is something that you would gui use to guide your policy? Uh, you know, I don't think you should put words in my mouth, but what I will say is that opposition parties are free to uh, say what they want to say in public. Um, that is up to them. And of course, the government will respond in a way that I think is responsible and appropriate for Canadians. But as I've said many times, um, I don't disclose the nature of the conversations that I have in public and I don't negotiate in public. But how opposition parties choose to share their own feelings is up to them. Respectfully, I'm not putting words into your mouth. I asked you on two different occasions whether an ultimatum issued by the government, or pardon me, by an opposition party, was the way to guide policy or priorities for the government, and you didn't explicitly say no. So am I to infer from that or interpret from that that it's okay for an opposition party to do that, and that will help govern your activities as a government? 
well, I mean, it's up to opposition parties how they choose to speak in public. That's not for me to decide uh, how they're going to go about, you know, their approach to a minority parliament. I can only speak on behalf of the government. Um, and as I've said, you know, what we are doing is uh, speaking to all of the opposition parties to try and make work parliament work for Canadians um, and ultimately to advance things that we know Canadians care about. So. This is what governing in a minority situation looks like. If the bloc chooses to, you know, issue ultimatums, that's up to them, and it's up to us to decide how we respond. But in this moment in time, uh, you know, we're certainly considering a wide range of things with a wide range of partners, um, you know, in terms of how we make this parliament work for Canadians, and that's my job. As far as the policy goes, you specifically haven't said this. I want to be clear about that, but you're many of your cabinet colleagues have, I think actually all of whom I listened to last week speak on the issue of boosting OAS to this age group. And I should point out that your government did boost it for Canadians over the age of 75. One of the primary, two of the primary things that they raised was A, the cost, and B, the impact that that cost would have on younger generations. It's estimated by the parliamentary budget officer to come to a, a cost of about $3 billion a year going forward. Um, I wonder, though, having listened to seniors over the past number of days who tell me very, very specifically that they would benefit from something like this, if, uh, you know, some responsibility lies in the priorities your government has set out when it comes to the way it spent its money, consultants up 88 percent, billions of dollars, in fact, since 2015, uh, the size of the public service up 42 percent. If you had spent money more wisely, might you be able to afford something like this that seniors overwhelmingly are saying would help them? Well, I think when you look at what we've done for seniors specifically, you know, the, one of the first things we did was increase the guaranteed income supplement for low income seniors when we came into office in 2015. As you mentioned, we did increase old age security for seniors 75 and over because we know as seniors age, their retirement savings can like decrease, but their expenses tend to go up. So there's a really important policy um, imperative to do that. We just brought in uh, dental care for low and moderate income seniors, which you know also has an impact uh, on their ability to, you know, go to the dentist, but also afford things more broadly. Um, and we also enhanced the Canada Pension Plan. So we've done a lot when it comes to supporting seniors. That doesn't mean that there isn't more to do. Um, and as I said, we are open to good ideas that are going to support Canadians of all ages, including seniors. Do you differ from your cabinet colleagues on concern over the cost? I am saying that, you know, we are open to good ideas. I think we have to be fiscally responsible. And I think when it comes to, you know, the things that we've spent on, you mentioned a couple of things, but I mean, those are really ancillary to the main cost. I mean, when we talk about, you know, big government spending um, in the past few years, it, it was supports during COVID. I mean, it was really, you know, the Canada emergency wage subsidy. It was the Canada emergency response benefit. It was the Canada emergency business assistance. I mean, those were like the real big ticket items that helped Canadians of all ages get through what was, you know, one of the most difficult times we've gone through, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, and, and it's with, you know, it's specifically why I didn't refer to those, because I do know that they were helpful to a lot of Canadians, but the size of the bureaucracy growing by 42%, sure, the size of the state grew during the pandemic, but not everything that it grew for was the pandemic. And when I talk about consultants, that is an outside criticism from the Auditor General as well. Like, it's an 88% jump from 2015, uh, I think warrants some scrutiny, particularly when you're deciding on uh, fiscal priorities. I did want to, before I let you sure, Minister, ask you about kind of... It's not the main thing that would change the fiscal framework, right? I mean, the main thing when we talk about big government spending over the past couple of years is really those supports that we provided to Canadians during the pandemic. I mean, that was an extraordinary time that required an extraordinary effort on behalf of government. And so I think it's really important sure, that... the size of the know, public service is a big line item, too. Sure, but in order to be able to deliver those supports and to be able to provide, you know, good services to Canadians, we need to make sure that we have people to do that. So, you know, I think that, you know, we have put in place some really important programs for Canadians, um, you know, whether it's with regards to increasing GIS and OAS for seniors or enhancing the Canada Pension Plan. I mean, affordable child care is another big one. Uh, the dental care program, again, is something that's really important for Canadians. That all takes public servants to help administer. But at the end of the day, 
that's benefiting Canadians of all generations. And those are some things that are really important for Canadians that, you know, it took our government to be able to bring forward. Um, and those are important things to, you know, spend um, Canadians money on because it's helping Canadians across the country. I want to switch gears before I let you go and ask, ask about another part of your portfolio as government house leader, which is kind of what's happening in Parliament right now. Uh, it's pretty complicated. I'm not sure everyone is paying super close attention, but there's essentially uh, a, an order that the, that the House voted on for your government to hand over documents, which would then go to the RCMP. Uh, the documents involve what's known as the Sustainable Development Technology Canada. It was an arm's length foundation. The Auditor General found a huge host of issues with it. It has since folded and become part of something else. Uh, the Conservatives are saying essentially that your refusal to comply with this order is because you have something to hide in those documents. I know that you have contended and pointed to comments from the RCMP that they wouldn't necessarily even be able to access those documents as part of the reason why you oppose handing them over. Can you be clear with Canadians? Does your government have anything in these documents to hide? Look, the, the point of all of this is that the Conservatives are using their extraordinary powers in Parliament to try to go around the charter protected rights of Canadians. This is the very first time it's unprecedented that parliamentarians are using their extraordinary powers to access documents, not for themselves, but to hand over to a third party. And what the speaker actually ruled was that yes, parliament has the uh, power to do this, but he said very clearly that he wanted this referred to a house committee to actually study this because it's so unprecedented and it has the potential to violate the rights of Canadians. And so the Conservatives right now are actually obstructing their own obstruction in the House because they don't want this to go to committee because if it goes to committee, there'll be a whole wide range of experts that come out and say this is an abuse of power, that Parliament shouldn't do this even if they have the right to do it. And both the RCMP and the Auditor General both raised their extreme discomfort with this because it compromises the really important independence of the police from the legislature and it compromises the independence of the Auditor General who's an independent agent of Parliament and even more than that it potentially violates the charter rights of Canadians because anytime police want to access documents they have to seek judicial oversight in order to suspend the rights of Canadians. And let's be very clear that the government did hand over documents, but they were redacted because the government also has a, an obligation to protect the rights of Canadians. And that is something that, you know, I would hope that even if the Conservatives were in power and this situation was reversed, that they would act in the same way because that's what responsible governments do. They have an obligation to protect the rights of Canadians. I actually remember when the Conservatives didn't want to turn out over documents related to Afghan detainees, and it was the Liberals with other parties arguing that they should be made public. Ultimately, the conclusion was reached to send them to a committee. Is it is it your position that if that, and, and I take your point on that vote different. not being voted on yet, no, but are, this are is you going to vote in favor of sending so, to a committee? Yes, yes, we will, absolutely. But it's not about sending the documents to a committee, and the Afghan detainee is actually different because it was documents for use by the parliamentary committee. Parliament has the right to request documents. That, you know, we understand and, and we agree with. The difference here is that Parliament is requesting these documents not for its own use, but to send to the RCMP. And what the Speaker ruled was not that the government needs to send these documents right away. It was that this particular motion needs to be sent to Parliament because even though, uh, to a committee, because even though Parliament has the right to do this, this is unprecedented in that it would violate the charter protected rights of Canadians. So the Conservatives are spinning this one way, but they're not telling the whole truth. They're actually filibustering their own motion because they don't want the discussion of this unprecedented abuse of Parliament's powers to go to committee because legal, judicial, police, parliamentary experts will come out and yeah. say this is unprecedented and this is not right. So they're actually filibustering their own motion right now because they don't want the truth to come out.
And I, and I do note that the, the speaker did, as you said, point to um, referring the matter itself to committee. He also did clearly say that your government did not fully comply with the order as it exists. I'll ask the first question I asked again. For the record, is the reason that you're not handing these documents over about this abuse of power in this arms length organization because you have something to hide? No, Vashi. The, you know, as you started at the outset, you know, the SDTC, the government, you know, has fully complied with the anything the RCMP or the Auditor General requests. But the fact of the matter is, is that the both the Auditor General and the RCMP have stated that this is not an appropriate way to conduct investigations. And they raised extreme discomfort with what the Conservatives are putting forward. And so the point here is that the speaker did say the there was a failure to comply with the motion but he's actually referring the motion itself to committee because there's an issue about how appropriate it is for parliament to use these powers which they have to circumvent the rights of canadians and so the matter at hand is actually not about SDTC itself, right? And you started off by saying that there were issues, and, and that's true, and that's why the government dealt with it. But the issue is about how conservative members of parliament are trying to circumvent the charter rights of Canadians and judicial oversight by using their powers to hand over documents to the police. The RCMP has yeah, even said I, that it's highly unlikely that they would be able to use these documents because of the inappropriate nature in which they would be. Yeah, they um, also said they weren't investigating it at the time, and then yes, uh, two days ago they said they were investigating it. I'm just asking point blank so, whether there is I, anything to hide. I, I take your point on your that. framing of what this is about. Yeah. No, no, but that's that's what this is about because this this motion right now. So the Conservatives are trying to play a political game right now. But it's a very dangerous game they are playing because they are trying to use their extraordinary powers for their own partisan pursuits. And I, and I don't think any of your viewers, want to live in a country where parliamentarians are directing police or the Auditor General for their own partisan gains. That is an extremely dangerous precedent that goes far beyond the appropriate use of our democratic tools in Canada and has never been done before. That's why the speaker is referring this matter to committee, because it's now up to parliament to decide how and whether they should follow this approach. Because I don't think any Canadian citizen, any Canadian organization, if you know they feel that they are the target of a partisan attack, would feel comfortable knowing that a majority in Parliament could then obtain their documents and send them to police without a search warrant, without getting judicial approval, without any guarantee to their charter rights. So from my perspective, this is a major issue that I think the alarm bells need to be rung by because it is about you know the trampling of the charter rights of Canadians. And there is a reason why the Conservatives are filibustering their own measure, because they don't want this to go to committee. Because when it goes to committee, legal experts, judicial experts, police experts, parliamentary procedure experts are going to come out and say, well, maybe Parliament has the right to do this, but there's a big question of whether they should. Okay, I'm going to leave it on that note. I appreciate your time as always, Minister. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vashi.